You know, if someone use Christine, you probably like <laughs> All right, let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the chance to be together. We ask that you would be with us and give us your presence and your spirit as we continue to walk through the Bible. Give us wisdom as we talk about the Gospel of John. So hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're on to chapter 3. Very famous chapter, very famous story, and I've got handouts up to verse 21. We'll see how far we get. We certainly won't get beyond that. <laughs> now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can anyone be born when they are how can anyone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You cannot be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. You should not be surprised at my saying, you, sh you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said. And, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then, if you, how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. If you read verse 19 and you remember the books of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, that will sound very familiar. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it will be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is a very famous, important chapter. Arguably, one of the most famous verses of the Bible is in it. Shows up, will show up, I'm sure, at some football games this afternoon all over America. <laughs> John 3.16, it's on overpasses. Um, it's all in the context of this story, and now we're really beginning to get into the meat of the Gospel of John, because this pattern of a story and then a dialogue will be the pattern that we will see throughout the Gospel of John. We'll keep working this pattern, but first we have to dive into the story, and then we will dive into the dialogue and, and get into all of, what, all of what Jesus will have to say in this manner. Any initial comments about this chapter by anyone? I think it's what caused, has caused a lot of denominations to schism where it talks about each, they should not, um, the qualifications of 
patients to be saved that hurt that had a lot to be on that. Oh yeah, and what do you mean by saved? And light and darkness. Um, part of the reason, so what we did in this course was first we did 2nd John, then 3rd John, and then 1st John, and now the Gospel of John. And if you read these books, you get a real good sense of the way John likes to talk. And so once you get into the Gospel of John, you're, you're fairly well set in terms of the way John sees the world and how he goes about writing. And I think we lost our one little wheel, which was exactly the right, the right distance. I have to, I might take all the wheels off this cart. <laughs> and that'll just kind of make an end to it. Okay, now let's start at verse one. And we have the we have the three we have three English translations. One which is very word for word. That's the LEB, the NIV, which has what are sometimes called dynamic equivalents. Um, Cameron noted that when the NIV came out in the 70s, it was a lot of talk about this translation because it's in some ways a little bit between the older style of translation, like the LEB or the King James and a paraphrase like the NLT, which is the one way over on your left-hand corner. Right. But right hand. What's that? Right hand. Right hand. Yeah, I'm dyslexic. Um, okay. So, first verse. Now there was a Pharisee. Okay. What's Pharisee? A group of religious leaders. Okay. For the Jewish community. Okay. Jewish? Part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. Well, you, now you're jumping to the next phrase. We're going to hold off on that. <laughs> Jewish. Now, Marty said a leader. The Pharisees were. Oh, see, this, everything gets complicated. Um, there's politics and religion. What's the difference? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> she says everything. He says very little. You're both right in some ways. Uh, what, what's the difference between politics and religion? One's uh, earthly, the other's spiritual. Earth, heaven. You might be noticing that did that whole earth-heaven dichotomy come up strongly in this chapter? So, but in Christianity, what happens on earth matters in heaven, right? They're connected. I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus is from above. So, we're, I mean, this dichotomy, earth and heaven, politics, religion. Sacred and secular. <laughs> secular. Sacred. I say they're both uh, sacred. It's a lot of people. Well, what happens when your politics becomes your religion? You get a theocracy. You people tend to die. But I'd say that happens in both. It does happen in both. Which is of ultimate concern. Power. And man and power. 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 politics is our religion. Well, okay, see, and, and the, 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 the reason that this is a difficult question to answer is very much because your perspective on this depends on far larger presuppositions and ideas that you hold. A lot of it has to do with what's the definition of religion? Some people will define religion. Religion is about supernatural things. And Marty's answer of matters in heaven tends to lead towards that. But another answer to the question, what is religion, is that which is of ultimate concern for any of us. So in other words, if you say, I think family is the most important thing, well then family is kind of your religion. 
Well, I think being happy is the most important thing. Well then, being happy is your religion. So the, the answer doesn't get easier, partly because there's a lot of debate as to how we use this word. In our political context, the American, the United States was founded on an experiment of the separation of politics and religion. Even though God's mentioned in the Constitution, so. God is not mentioned in the Constitution. God is mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence has no legal standing. Constitution is the basis for all legality in America. The reason they, well, and here's, there's a big question. Was America founded on the separation of church and state? Well, yes, on the separation of church and state at the federal government, but a lot of people argue America was founded upon a lot of religious ideas that it was assumed people would commonly hold. The Senate's always had a chaplain. You know, they begin processions with a prayer. So, I mean. That's right. There, and, and so this, th this issue right here, you say, well, why are we talking about this now? It's because of this word, Pharisee. The Pharisees were in some ways a political party and a religious party. Now, here's one of the things that we've had happening in America over the last 20 years, that in some ways, the political parties have gotten sort of religious. Karl Rowe, who was a political advisor to help elect George W. Bush, Karl Rove, Karl Rove noticed, looking at the political landscape, that if he could mobilize the evangelical Christian vote, George W. Bush would win the White House. Okay? Well, what did that mean? Well, if you're a political handler, it means you send him to certain kinds of events. It means you have him use certain catchphrases. It means you have him take certain positions on things. In order to win the vote of a certain religious group, in order to make Republicans, well, a certain religious party. Now, here's another interesting tidbit. Which broad racial group in America today has the highest percentage of weekly churchgoers? Blacks. Blacks in America. Which political party has a near lock on African American votes? The Democrats. The Democrats. And so what you see happening is in American politics, politics and religion get really intertwined. So you have a lot of white evangelicals that the Republicans pursue, and you have a lot of black churchgoers, many of whom fairly conservative socially, um, they vote Democrat. And a lot of times people can't figure that out. Well, I mean, everything is changing. So Donald Trump comes in, and why is Donald Trump so adamant? The guy's not adamant on almost anything that has to do re with religion. To get him to talk about, there's, there's, there's funny interviews out there trying to have Donald Trump talk about his relationship with the Bible. And to talk to the man, it's like, I don't think he's ever read it. Well, what's your favorite, what's your favorite passage in the Bible? Well, I, there's so many good ones. I like them all. What well, can you name one? And, 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 you know, there's all these little signs that the guy's never read much of this. And given his lifestyle, I mean, anybody who knew him before his political career, this comes as no surprise. He's I mean, wise. yeah, that's right. So, but in terms of his political persona, He's got to play a role that aligns with religion because he knows that in many ways your politics are built upon your religious ideas if you understand religion to be those things of ultimate concern for you, your shape of the world. Now this division between politics and religion, this has been toyed with in various empires throughout the years. Some empires, for example, the Roman Empire 
had their own religion, but it was a polytheistic empire, so you might have to go to the shrine of the empire, but you can also go to your own family shrine or your local shrine or your regional deity or, or the mystery religion that suits you. So in polytheism, there was a flexibility. It's interesting that in the American schema, there's, a, there's also flexibility because if I would go to Washington, D.C. and walk up into the Lincoln Memorial, no one would think, is Paul violating his Christianity? But if I were to take someone from Paul, the Apostle Paul's time in the Roman Empire, transport them to the steps of the Washington Memorial, and they would look at the Washington Memorial, what type of building would they imagine it is? It's a temple. Well, what does a temple look like? Well, go to Athens. What's on top of the Acropolis at Athens? A giant marble building with huge marble pillars. Now, they're pretty much ruins now, but in the ancient world, if you were to walk into such a building, what would you expect to see? An enormous statue, usually of a man. If you Google the Temple of Zeus and you Google and you look at a picture of the Lincoln Memorial, they're kind of the same thing. Now, but in our frame of reference, the Lincoln Memorial is political. Because when we walk into the Lincoln Memorial, we're not there to worship the man on the throne, or are we? Where did Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech take place? In front of the memorial. On the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Any ancient person who would go to Washington, D.C. would say, well, this is the head of empire and it's full of temples. Temples to the gods of the empire. Well, who are the gods of the American empire? George Washington. Look at the Washington Memorial. Transport yourself to 3000 BC to ancient Egypt. What will you see? You'll see an obelisk. What's the Washington Memorial? It's an obelisk. Now, I'm not trying to say no one, no Christian shouldn't go to visit the Washington Memorial. I've been there many times. I am saying these categories function in ways we don't think about often but they are functioning all the time in our politics and in our religion. Now, when I asked you the question, Marty jumped in pretty fast and had a pretty significant separation. And that's because she's speaking out of our tradition, the tradition of this denomination, which, well, so this denomination was founded by Dutch immigrants. So all these mostly poor Dutchmen came over from the northern reaches of the Netherlands um, took care of cows in America and were poor and started to build churches to have their little immigrant churches around. Black folks, once they had a little bit of freedom, they had their black churches. And the black church was in many ways the cornerstone of the black community because it was the one institution they could own together. And so, same thing with the Dutch immigrants. They came to America, churches were the one institution they could own together. And so they ran the show in their little institution. They didn't run the show out there in the world because there are too many other people with too much money and too much power. They have their own little thing. Immigrants do this all the time. When you go around a city like this, you will find lots of churches that they just look like churches. But you walk in the door, you realize everyone here speaks Spanish. Why are all these Spanish speakers congregating in one place? You dig a little bit deeper, you'll discover all these Spanish speakers are from one little region in Central America. Why are they all clumped together in one church? Go to the Slavic church down the road. Same dynamic, okay? So the Dutchmen come to America, and they're all in their little churches, and they're all trying to learn the language of the Americans out there in the world, but they have to talk in the market and, and try, to make a, try to make a living. But when they're in church, what language are they speaking? Go across the street at the same time we have church this morning. What language you will hear in that will you hear in that church across the street? Ellos hablan español. 
Cuando están predicando, orando, hablando con Dios, they talk to God in their mother tongue because that's closest to their hearts. Well, the Dutchmen had a problem. They all came in like the tail end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and World War I broke out. Well, most of us don't know, but in World War I, people had a real issue with a certain ethnic group in America. They were the Germans. You know, you know the name of Germany? Deutschland. We, ever hear of Pennsylvania Dutch? They're not Dutch, they're German. But most Americans, well, you got all these kind of white, blonde hair, blue-eyed people congregating in that building over there, and we don't really know what goes on in there. They're kind of in the cover of a church, and they're speaking a language we don't understand. Deutsch? Dutch? I think they're German in that place. And what are they doing not talking America, conspiring? So what did... What did Dutch Christian Reformed churches start doing? Put flags all over the building. <laughs> we're not German, we're Dutch, we're Dutch. Well, how do I know you're Dutch? Because I say so. Uh, Deutsch, Dutch, sounds all the same to me. What do folks know? So flags go up all in the churches. Now everybody wants to be an American. And guess what happened during World War I? Christian Reformed churches stopped speaking Dutch in their worship services. They started preaching in English. Why? The American. So if the American walk in the door, they'll hear, they weren't hearing conspiracy against the United States in league with the Germans. They're fighting in World War I. They'll hear, oh, they're just talking about the Bible. Oh, I guess they're okay. So that's why Dutch immigrants started having services in English. And it was very difficult to talk that way in the church because it was their second language. But this is the process of immigration, okay? So you've got all of these dynamics, but here's the thing. It's very easy to build a religion on the backs of politics because political ideas are very salient. Abortion, gay rights, gun rights, um, um, civil rights. These, these political ideas polarize and mobilize people. And if you're a pastor trying to start a church, and American churches are very market-driven, well, appeal to people's fears and desires. Well, isn't that what, I mean, Donald Trump started the 2016 election talking about immigration. And everyone was like, well, um, health care, isn't that supposed to be the debate we're having? Donald Trump was very savvy because immigration is an issue that can very much play on <coughs> fear of the unknown foreigner. You can mobilize a group based on their fears faster than almost everything else. That works in politics, and it works in religion. D. James Kennedy had a process called evangelism explosion that was, if you were to die tonight, <gasps> fear of death. Everybody's got fear of death. If you were to die tonight, what would you say to God to let him into, to, let, to have him let you into his kingdom? That makes people immediately afraid Oh, now you've got their attention. Now, in some ways, they are receptive to what you have to give them. It'd be very, and, and you can play this game. It'd be very interesting. It'd be very easy to say, let's say, in the black community. You know, 50 years ago, all those landscaping and construction jobs, well, you know, a lot of 50, 75 years ago, Black folks were moving up from the South to places like California and the North and the East in order to work those, those jobs, those factory jobs, those construction jobs, those, those, those blue collar jobs. Who's working all those jobs today? Spanish speaking people. That's all we know about them. They speak Spanish. Well, someone should come along and put an end to those Spanish-speaking people coming here and taking your jobs. Well, yeah. I want those jobs. Well, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. Well, I know those were crappy jobs anyway. I want those other jobs. 
So maybe you'll grow get an education. But you see, fears are something that can mobilize people, and that's useful. All right. So the Pharisees were politics and religion were one thing in the ancient world. And in many ways, they continue to be one thing. But really, what they're, what they're a shift of, which is reflected in the earth and heaven idea, is religion is about the ultimate, and politics is about the immediate. So politics is about the job. Religion is about the life. Now, the job and the life are connected, but they're connected in different ways. In many ways, this difference is about time, not just amount of time, although it is, but in fact, the entire conception of time. Politics is about the now. Religion is about the always. And the now and the always are always connected now. They really are. And so that's why we're always dealing with these issues. Now the Pharisees were a, see if I use the word party, then we kind of hear them in a political fashion within our language. If I talk about them as a sect, then we hear them in religious terms. They were both a party and a sect. So they had ideas that were highly political and ideas that were obviously religious. Now, let's figure out what some of their ideas were. We meet the Pharisees in the Gospels often. You don't meet the Pharisees in the Old Testament because they weren't around in the Old Testament. The Pharisees were a product of the long history, sort of like Democrats and Republicans. If you read about the, if you read about the colonial period in the United States, you don't find Democrats and Republicans. If you study what George Washington wanted for the United States, George Washington was against political parties. And in fact, the first 20 years of American history had in the formation of political parties. Well, what are political parties? The same philosophy held by a group of people. Okay, the same philosophy held by a group of people. But what's interesting is that their philosophies are often flexible because really one way to understand the political parties is about their goal. What is the goal of the Republicans in the next presidential election? To retain control of the White House. To retain control of the White House. And at this point, their strategy is, in fact, they're, some, now the Republicans, see there's politics between the parties and there's politics within the parties. The politics scales all the way down, so some Republicans are now we're not going to have, in certain states, some Republicans are saying, we're not going to have political primaries this year. Mistake. <laughs> Marty says, that's a mistake. Why is that a mistake? I don't know. It's a mistake. <laughs> it's a mis <laughs> who, doesn't want, who doesn't want there to be primaries? In Trump. Trump. Why? Because he doesn't want a challenger. Right. <laughs> Right, and so the, 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 the movement to make sure you don't have primaries is actually an expression of weakness because Trump, I mean, and everybody knows that Trump's ego is, is paper thin because, he, and right, we saw this right when he got into the White House because what was like one of the issues he was obsessed at right away? whether his inaugural um, crowd was larger than Obama's. And it's like, this is, a, this is a conversation about ego. This is not a substantive conversation about law or policy. So, so, so right away, but the job of the, of the political party is to gain power. And so what's happening amongst the Dems, they have all these different people 
And well, why is Obama, why is Biden sort of the presumptive nominee? Because you want to win, and everybody's thinking maybe we can win with Biden. And the number one thing is to take political power. That's what parties do. Okay? That's their job. Now, Pharisees, they weren't around in the Old Testament. They were a product of if you go back into Israelite history, you have, first you have the, all these tribes in, all these tribes that make up Israel, and then under one king, the tribes come together. That was Saul. And they came together in order to fight the Philistines, who were people that came from the larger world over the sea, and they immigrated into this area, and they dominated the, the people of Israel, who were these loose group of tribes. And so in order for these tribes to finally deal with the Philistine threat, they needed to mobilize, and they needed to, they needed to come under one rule, because the Philistines were technologically more advanced than the children of Israel, and you can read about this in the book of Samuel. They didn't let them use, they, the Philistines kept a monopoly on iron. Now, there's the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. You say, well, what's the deal with the Bronze Age to the Iron Age? Well, before they were making swords and knives and implements out of bronze, but bronze is, it's malleable. It's a nice conductor. Iron is harder. So an iron sword, a steel sword, is far better than a bronze sword. It holds the edge longer, it lasts longer. So the Philistines were dominating the Israelites because they were divided, so they united under Saul. In a sense, they formed a party with one objective, which was to deal with the Philistine threat. And Saul, well, didn't really do it. So then who came after Saul? David. David did it. David finally subdued the Philistines, and he subdued the Moabites, and the Edomites, and the Ammonites, and he created a kingdom that dominated the region. They were on top. And then Saul's son Solomon continued, and then domination continued, but after Solomon, what happened? Kingdom divided. The kingdom divided. And so for the next number of hundred years, you have this divided kingdom. Sometimes they were together against joint threats because they had some familial cohesion that they were all Israelites. And when they weren't divided, they were, then they were often subject to other powers. Now, what happens is that way up in the north, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Fertile Crescent, a geopolitical fact about this land is it's between Egypt and it's between Mesopotamia, and they really only had a degree of autonomy when these two regions were weak for some very real reasons. So eventually Assyria comes, peels off the northern kingdom, scatters them, Babylon comes, destroys the temple in Jerusalem, breaks the power of the southern kingdom, and ever since that point, they only had brief fleeting periods of autonomy they were always subjected to these larger pagan empires. All right? But they, people's identity usually comes from a story. What's the story of Israel? What is her identity in their own minds? God's chosen people. They're God's chosen people. And so this continual, this continual subjugation by these pagan empires causes an intellectual problem for them. How can we both be God's chosen people destined to rule the world and be from Alabama? And nobody gives us no respect. <laughs> and everybody makes jokes about Alabama. What do you call, what do you call your wife in Alabama? Your cousin. <laughs> there, yeah, there's, there's lots of jokes. Uh, hey, I'm from New Jersey. Do you think there aren't New Jersey jokes? So this is the thing. Israel, they're supposed to be God's chosen people, and they're at the bottom of the heap. What are you going to do 
about the imperial problem. Now here's the crazy thing about the Jews. They never lost their identity. Point to a place in town where the Babylonians are. <clears throat> They're not around. They, they maintain their identity from the ancient period until now through their stories. And you talk to you talk to a Jewish community today. Are you God's chosen people? They're Americans, and so they don't really like playing with hierarchies. But yeah, you can go on YouTube, and you can find really observant Jews basically say, "We Jews are true humans, and everyone else is just kind of animals." I mean, that, that doesn't play in America. But, you know, this is what's going on. But now, you have a problem with empire, and so what happens in, you, what happens in this region is that the menu of realistic options to deal with pagan empires gets manifest in these politi political religious parties, okay? So, you've got empire, and you've got hundreds of years of subjugation. And it'd be like if there was a, if it'd be like if there was a tribe in somewhere in the United States that believed they were God's chosen people. In fact, almost every group has this in their, in their, in their historical background. Well, what do you do with the American problem? Say, you know, this is our land, and if we really want to receive our inheritance and and appreciate the fact that this is our land, well, what do you got to do if you're a Native American? Something to rest. Get rid of all of these immigrants into the United States. Well, what percentage of people in the United States are Native American? Well, it kind of depends how you count them. Pretty tiny. How are you going to get rid of your other 300 plus million immigrants. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. Remember a number of years ago before Alcatraz was turned into a tourist attraction? Remember what happened on, on that island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay? Y'all lived here, I didn't. Who took it over? Some Indians took over the, the, the island that Alcatraz is on. Oh, what, what, what are those Indians so upset about? We're all here. <laughs> they don't own nothing. They're being subjugated. Their, their culture is being destroyed by the ongoing pressure of the larger world around them. Their languages are disappearing. Their land has been taken. Their daughters are marrying and having children that are American and not Navajo or Zuni or Sioux or any of those things. They're being destroyed as a people by all these people coming in. What are, you gonna, what are the menu of options you can do to address that fact? Well, let's just talk about them theoretically. One is, if you can't beat them, join them. That was the aristocracy. And the, the, the chief guy of, the, of that faction loved to build big monuments, had a huge ego, had an appetite for women, but didn't really trust anyone. And his name was Donald Herod. <laughs> In a lot of ways, there's you know just a lot of commonalities throughout history. And so the aristocracy was basically like, you know what, we're not getting rid of the Romans. The Romans are a fact. They're not going away. And no matter how many of us little Hebrews get together with our sticks and stones and knives, you make a big enough fuss and the legions are going to come down and grind you into the dust. And you know what? They were right. Because over a 200 year period, all kinds of revolutionaries from the Hebrews thought, we're going to kick out the Romans. And they tried it dozens of times. And you know what? They always ended the same. They get to a certain point and 
Well, the Romans' clients would put them down. And if they really got to the point of a really good rebellion, that's what happened between 68 and 71 AD. Well, the Romans, the Romans didn't like to expend energy on what they didn't have to. But if you kicked them hard enough, they were going to hit you so hard, you would never think about hitting them again. And that's exactly what they did between 68 and 71 AD. They came down with their legions and they, well, what did they do to Jerusalem? They went into Jerusalem and they took down her walls and they destroyed the temple and left not one stone on another. When Jesus says, not one stone will be left on another in the temple, well, certainly it was prophetic, but you know what? It was also realistic because the Romans knew how to put down an insurgency and when they did it, they were efficient and ruthless and complete. So when you had this little group of Jews up on Masada, built by Herod, kind of holding out, the Romans looked at that and were like, oh, you know how much, to, how much work it's gonna be to get up into that place and kill those people? That's gonna be so much work. But, what if we let them live? You know, Che Guevara shirts will show up all over the place. So what did the Romans do? Built a massive ramp. When they got up to the top, everyone up there was like, okay, the jig is up, we're not gonna let the Romans have the satisfaction of killing us, we'll kill each other. So they all committed mass suicide up there. That's the world we're talking about here, okay? We Americans are soft compared to the people of this world. So the aristocracy looks at the political situation and says, if you can't beat them, join them. Let's, you know, okay, they'll have their, they'll have their horse races, they'll have their little cult to the gods, just let all that stuff go. You can make a lot of money working with the Romans. If you get in and get tight with them, Herod the Great became a friend of Julius Caesar. If you play the game, you can get far. That's what the aristocracy did. That's what I was saying. <laughs> None of this changes. <laughs> look, at, look at Vietnam, you know, we, we destroy it, and then now it's amazing. They love Americans, and they pay Americans to go over there and teach them English. Isn't that funny? <laughs> so then there are the Essenes. The Essenes, so one, one item on the menu is, if you can't beat them, join them. The other item on the menu is, you'll take my Hebrew identity from me, you'll have to peel it out of my cold, dead hands. That was the Essenes. They had bunkers all over the desert. Dead Sea Scrolls came from these people. They're like, you know what? God's going to kill those Romans. And when he comes in and blasts them, God's going to nuke them, we're going to be out in our bunkers in the desert laughing. That's what they did. John the Baptist is in some ways sometimes associated with them. So if you can't beat them, join them. This is the, this is the never Trump tribe. We're never, ever, ever going to give in to empire. We're going to stay pure, religiously devoted, no compromise. So this is all compromise. This is no compromise. Guess what the Pharisees are? Both. Moderates. <laughs> They're like, you know, we're going to resist the Romans till the day we die, but our resistance is going to be subtle. subtle. We're going to live in the empire, but not be of the empire. Now, the location of this party is really important to understand their relationship with Jesus. Because the relationship between the Pharisees and Jesus is a very nuanced relationship. After Jesus, after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, a lot of Pharisees join the Jesus party. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body after the crucifixion. So the Pharisees are the moderates. Okay, but remember, they're religious. So, what does a religiously moderate, observant person care about in the Jewish culture war in the first century AD? Keeping his Jewishness. Keeping his Jewishness, good. Now, the question is, well, okay, let me ask you this. If 
you do what do you lose your black card? Vote for Trump. Mary. <laughs> Vote for Trump. <laughs> or at least admit you voted for Trump. <laughs> Marry someone of another ethnicity. That could, that might get you into a tr into trouble. You know, if you're you know, especially if you're a if you're a black man who has a good job, and a lot of the other women are in the community are like, that's exactly the kind of man we need more of. And then you go marry a white woman. <laughs> So, you know, when I was growing up, you lose your Christian Reformed card by marrying a Catholic. You might get away with marrying someone from the Reformed Church of America, but a Roman Catholic? No, nope, that's a bridge too far. Everybody's got their cards, but it has everything to do with identity. And so, well, if you read the Gospels, you can basically get a lineup of all the subtle identity markers that the Pharisees and Jesus are dealing with. I mean, when I was, I have to wrap this up, but um, when I was first reading the Bible for myself in college and trying to understand the Bible, I'd read the Gospels and I'd be like, look at the issues they're fighting over. What kind of issues did they fight over in the Gospels? Sabbath observance. What's that? Sabbath observance. Sabbath observance. Jesus heals in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And everyone's like, well, we can't do that. That's work. What kind of work is that? How many people are how many people are doing miracles during the week and say, I ain't gonna do any miracles on the Sabbath? <laughs> how many of them are there? We all know what work is. Work is working in your field. And so Sabbath observance, dietary laws. See what happens in a moderate religious political community, if they're trying to live in the empire but not of it. They have a whole list of things that you will and won't do that to just about everybody else looks silly. So when I was in college, my wife, her mother was fundamentalist Baptist. And I came from the Christian Reformed Church. If you came from the Christian Reformed Church, see some people in this room know what you did and didn't do. What didn't you do on Sunday if you came from the Christian Reformed Church? Go to the store. Go to the store. Go out to eat. But could you drink alcohol? Yeah. Could you smoke? Yeah. You could do that if you were CRC. For my fundamentalist mother-in-law Baptist, she'd go, she'd go out to eat on Sunday after church with all of her church friends. We Christian four people looking at it like, well, that's horrible. <laughs> Making those restaurant workers work on the Sabbath. That's terrible. And then they'd look over at the CRC people outside of church, before church, having their last little smoke. <laughs> Sunday night, going home, enjoying a little, little drink before bedtime. Baptist looked at them and said, well, that's horrible, those Christian Reformed churches smoking and drinking like they do. Now all the rest of the Americans looked at them and said, they're all weird people. <laughs> These people won't go out to eat on Sunday. These people won't smoke or drink. What's with that? Well, that's what's going on. Because other people of other nationalities would look at the Jews and say, why don't they do any work on that seventh day? They, they won't even leave the house. They won't even let their servants work for them. What's with that? All days are the same. See, so then when you look at Jesus and the Pharisees in the Gospels, then you look at the Apostle Paul in the epistles, and you notice there's whole groups of other issues that they're engaging. Can you go into a temple, meat sacrifice to idols, um, having sex with prostitutes? Uh, these weren't even talked about in the Jewish community. They were a bridge too far. But these are all the issues that Paul is dealing with out in the Roman Empire. And well, it's, these are all the boundary marker issues that define identity. And this identity exchange is, has everything to do with, we only got into the first phrase of the first verse of this chapter today. But it has everything to do with the fact that he's 
a Pharisee on the Jewish ruling council that doesn't just have Pharisees. It has aristocrats, too, are, who are, if you can't beat them, join them. So they're a faction in the ruling council of the Jews, and he comes to Jesus in broad daylight in the middle of the temple square for everyone to see? No, nope. yeah. night. night. It wasn't politically correct. Psst, Jesus, can I have a word with you? We, we kind of think you might be with us on some of these issues. Maybe we can have a little political conversation and make an alliance because we want to, we're playing this political struggle game. You know, it's like, it's like um, uh, Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump. Remember during the election? Donald Trump gives Lindsey Graham's personal cell phone number away, uh, uh, you know, away to America. And Donald Trump is mercilessly mocking Lindsey Graham. After the election, they're like best friends. They're like best friends. Well, how does that work? Politics, my friend. Politics is the part, is the, is the means of creating creating allies and allegiances in order to achieve your goal. And the goal of the Pharisees was, well, religious goals, political goals. So he comes to Jesus at night. This is a back channel communication, seeing if Jesus can be worked with, because Jesus has gotten popular. Okay, well, then the conversation goes in directions that Nicodemus had no idea about. He thought he was going to have a make a nice political alliance so that maybe they could team up. And what he learns was that nobody, Jesus doesn't join your team. You join his. And so I've been aligning Donald Trump to Herod throughout this. Well, it's kind of like Donald Trump. Donald Trump doesn't join your team. He's a terrible team player. It's Donald Trump's way or the highway. The possible exception, possible, well, if you're Ivanka. I mean, that seems to be the exception to the rule. But that's the way it is, right? This is how we are. Well, that's true. Mark Sander found that out. That, he did find that out. You don't, you don't, you don't have Donald Trump. You join your team. In fact, the whole look at the beginning of the 2016 campaign. Everybody wanted Donald Trump to sign something that said he wouldn't run as an independent. Well, a few months later, they were probably sorry they made him sign it. But that's how politics works, because politics is of the now, and religion is of the ultimate. The thing is. What's expedient in the now that is, doesn't always work in the ultimate. Ask anybody who has impulse issues. Well, I feel like having, having, you know, I love blank tattooed across my forehead. Yeah, seemed good at the moment. Two years later when whoever's name you tattooed on your forehead doesn't want to see you or you don't want to see them, you still got that tattoo to deal with. That's why there's always the relationship between the now and the ultimate. And some of these, probably some of these guys who are trying to primary Trump, run against him in the primaries, they know they're not going to win. What game are they playing? After Trump is gone, after people don't, after people have Trump remorse, they're going to stand up and say what? I told you so. I ran against him. When Obama ran in 2008 against Hillary, there was a vote that was really important that everybody looked at. Yes or no on the Iraq war? Obama could say, I voted against the Iraq war, Hillary voted for it. In 2008, that was a big deal. Now again, remember, politics is the now. Religion is the ultimate. We forget politics very quickly because it's of the now. And that's Joe Biden's problem right now. What did you vote on busing? Half of the nation says, what? Busing? 
Us older folks who remember the busing controversies of the 70s were like, oh yeah, that was a fight then, wasn't it? But politics is of the now, religion is of the ultimate, of the always. We're out of time. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for the Bible. And Lord, the Bible gives us perspective on our life in many ways that we don't even understand. And we see right in this meeting of Nicodemus and Jesus, all the relationships between all the things that we deal with. Some of these forms of politics don't change. Lord, we ask as we, as we read the Bible and as we learn from it, as we, as we discover Jesus in a political context, Help us to learn, help us to learn from you about the world. And so we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work, continue to give us wisdom, and, and help us to follow you in the now and the always. So hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. So keep your sheets, because we only got the first phrase of the first verse. We'll need them again. We'll need them again. At least once. At least once. <laughs> <laughs>